Hi, I'm Debbie Hamlet with Nebraska's PBS and NPR station. Thank you for joining our live stream well-beings event, You Are Not Alone, Youth Mental Health in Nebraska. Did you know the leading cause of death in Nebraska for ages 10 to 24 is suicide? There are ways to get help and to help those around you. You can find Nebraska resources at netnebraska.org slash wellbeings. We're looking forward to your questions and an important discussion moderated by Dr. Dave Myers from Bryan Health, along with other Nebraska mental health professionals. You'll also see young adults sharing personal stories about their mental health journey. Post your questions and location in the comment section on the NET Nebraska Facebook or YouTube pages. But first, let's hear from Ken Burns and see a preview of his next documentary, Hiding in Plain Sight, Our Mental Health Crisis, which will air on PBS stations across the country in the spring of 2022. Good afternoon, I'm Ken Burns. People have often asked me why, after more than 40 years of making films strictly about American history, would I executive produce documentaries on subjects like cancer and genetics, and now youth mental health? Why? Many of our films have, in their own way, dealt with mental health issues. Abraham Lincoln was severely depressed. Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark was bipolar. And of course, many tens of thousands of veterans of the Civil War, World War I and II, and Vietnam have suffered from PTSD and other health challenges. Today, our country is experiencing a mental health crisis, so the topic has to be confronted head on. This collaboration between America's leading brain and mental health advocates, foundations, corporations, and philanthropists, this great production team, and of course PBS, can make a major contribution to raising awareness about this issue and in the process give hope to countless people who have been reluctant, if not afraid, to ask for help. As a society, we continue to test the resiliency of youth without truly understanding how the stresses of today, including these unprecedented times, are impacting them. We've set out to listen to and to learn from America's young people, documenting their experiences, but also listening to how they are identifying new ways to address mental health challenges. It is a remarkable journey that we hope will capture the unique voices of these young people as they navigate an extraordinarily difficult moment in our country's history. We're very happy to share some early interview footage from this film in production. Thank you so much for your support of this important project. The only thing I know how to do is to share my own story and my own experience. I can't tell anyone what they can't see for themselves, but I can tell them what it was like for me, what happened to me, and what it's like now that I have recognized my own illness. It was something in the back of my head, really. It was not something that I didn't really worry about. My dad was an alcoholic, and just like the anxiety of him coming home at night, it's a strange thing to look back on and think to myself, I really didn't care about anything at that point. I remember a lot of nights where I would sit in my bed and cry, like, for hours after hours. I felt a lot of pain inside, and um, I, couldn't, I couldn't explain that. I couldn't relay that to other people outside. The feeling is like walking through, um, it's like being pulled down, being pulled into like quicksand. It affects my daily life all day, every day. I go to school, you know, you put on a face, a facade, you're happy, you're bubbly, and then you eat lunch alone in the bathroom. <laughs> I started to self-harm. I learned it in a book that I read. I'm tired of the I'm tired of the voices. I'm tired of everybody labeling me and saying I'm crazy. What happens to people with a serious mental illness is that 
just like a serious cancer, it begins to metastasize. It, it, it turns into disability. I remember waking up and being in the psych ward and being like, what am I doing here? I had a very high opinion of myself. It gets complicated by substance abuse. Drugs and alcohol worked very well for me because they took that anxiety that I had and that sense of isolation and they eliminated those things. Drugs and drinking and um, that was kind of my excuse, like that outside excuse to, to match up that feeling of powerlessness inside. When I finally did like start to think like, oh, I'm probably an addict, I was like, no, like you're just lying to yourself, you know. When the suicide rate goes up, nobody even knows about it. I still had a whole future that I had planned, you know, it's like I was planning the suicide, but at the same time, you know, I was making plans to like go out to the movies with my friends the next week. My life was gonna end one way, and that was being addicted to drugs, so why not start now? Like, I wasn't meant to be on this earth. Long sleeves, no one knew that what I was, no one knew what was on my wrist. It was actually on social media. These boys were harassing me about something I did. I like couldn't deal with it anymore. Yeah, I actually went through with it. I actually tried to hurt myself. Those are the moments where I have the best opportunity to plant a seed in someone else's mind. The fact of the matter is, if you don't show some vulnerability, if you don't speak honestly, then there's no truth. And if there's no truth, there's no connection. It's taken me a very, very long time to even speak openly about it. I think there's a lot of pressure in being vulnerable, especially now with social media and everyone judging you. My roommates don't even know half of this stuff that I'm telling you guys now. And I'm nervous, like I'm kind of shaking inside to even talk about it. But if I can even reach two people from everything I say or this story, then I, I did my part in this world. We don't understand how common it is. We don't understand how important it is to talk about it and be open about it. So this is the problem that we all deal with in secret. And the result is that we don't deal with it well. Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Dave Myers. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Bryan Medical Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome to our program, our well-beings event, our discussion about youth mental health here in Nebraska. What a powerful introduction with the Ken Burns documentary trailer. I'm so looking forward to that uh, coming out here in the next, in about the next year. That's gonna be a, a very powerful uh, program uh, encompassing behavioral health services in terms of uh, taking mental health awareness, uh, substance use prevention, and suicide prevention all in one program and, and really bringing mental health, uh, substance use, and suicide prevention to the forefront, uh, showing us that, you know, it's, it's the same uh, mental illness is no different than if I were to have a, diag a diagnosis of heart disease or uh, diabetes, that mental illness is a brain disorder and that it's, it, there's hope, there's help, and there's healing. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today is, is about youth mental health. And um, I will, before we get into the program, I wanna introduce our, our distinguished panel. Um, I wanna uh, first wanna introduce uh, uh, Nate Casey, uh, Nate is the program manager at Soaring Over Meth program um, in suicide at the Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition out of Omaha. And so this is a prevention and community outreach program developed in response to the high rate of suicide and methamphetamine use among Native Americans. I also would like to introduce Miguel uh, Estevez. Miguel is an English, Spanish, and Portuguese trilingual mental health professional serving young Nebraskans and others through programs and therapy to cope with traumatic events 
mental health conditions, including substance use, self-harm, and suicidal thoughts at the Friendship House in Grand Island, Nebraska. And then Chris Hellstrom is with the Boys Town National Hotline. Chris has worked with the Boys Town National uh, organization for over 25 years and is the hotline manager. She's worked directly um, with youth as a crisis counselor in her career and has worked as, as a staff trainer. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today. To start out with, Chris, when, I, you know, we're, we're in a, a time of, of uh, you know, year where the, where the holidays are, you know, roll right around the corner with uh, Christmas and New Year's, but we're many months into the pandemic. And what are you hearing in terms of, of the kind of the most themes coming into the hotline from youth? Well, we've definitely seen an increase in the number of kids who are reaching out to us with thoughts of suicide. Um, that There's been a steady increase of that probably in about the last year, but definitely since March. Um, and you know, you can look at that two ways. One, you can say, oh, that's terrible that that many more kids are thinking about it. Um, but to some degree, it's great that they're reaching out for help. So um, we've seen an increase, but um, it, maybe that's a good thing because kids know, all right, I'm, I've hit a point where I've got to get somebody else um, to help me with what's going on. I think a lot of what we're seeing is kids you know, just everything with COVID, things that are canceled, um, their connections with peers who are often um, a real source of support, suddenly they're a little bit more disconnected and they're spending a lot of time with their family. Uh, and you'd like to think families are the biggest support and the biggest connection that kids can have, but uh, there might be a little bit too much togetherness right now. Yes, yes, definitely. M Miguel, um, in terms of, of uh, kind of the central Nebraska, in terms of treating youth and working with youth, um, you know, once somebody calls into a hotline and, you know, they are connected and, and Chris made a good point that, you know, it's great that, you know, that in one way that we're seeing the numbers increase because it's showing that youth are reaching out and they are asking for help. So once they reach out for help, uh, can you just tell us just briefly what's the therapy process like? Yeah, and so we're, again, we're seeing the rise of more people calling, and we're also seeing a, a rise in uh, people coming to therapy, which is a really good thing. Uh, I've had a lot of teenagers come in, uh, and they're trying to uh, figure out how do I how do I stay normal in this like global pandemic and how do I keep my mental health good when I start to do either online homework or uh, I have to do all these other things on top of like, I can't go to exercise, I can't work out. So a lot of the first session, honestly, is uh, we usually call the initial diagnostic test, um, but we, I just kind of go through a lot of questions, but if they are really, really struggling, I just take the time to kind of hear what, what they're bringing to the table and, and letting them express themselves. Sometimes uh, a lot of the people, predominantly uh, um, people of color, uh, may, not, may not have those conversations with their parents and it kind of feels like, ah, you get it. So it's just like a big kind of like a sense of relief because they hadn't been able to have that type of conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Nate, um, I want to talk a little bit about the cultural factors as far as individuals asking for help. I know in the, in the Native uh, American uh, culture, Sometimes it's it's not as easy for individuals to um, you know to go to the traditional route of, of uh, what we call traditional route of asking, calling for a counselor, and it might go from uh, in terms of the cultural traditional um, healing arts and and, the, and those types of routes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, just kind of historically, there's somewhat of a uh, distrust with Native American communities and traditional Western medicine that thought um, you know the forced sterilizations of thousand Native Americans and all the other atrocities committed during the boarding school periods and that type of thing really kind of has cemented this distrust in general sometimes. Uh, but what we try to do with our program is we just try to really enforce a community-like feeling and a, like a feeling of support, um, especially right now considering COVID and everything. Um, a lot of the gatherings that we would typically have are have been canceled um, for, for good reasons. We've seen the Diné Navajo Nation be absolutely ravaged by the virus as well as even in Omaha. Um, up on the reservations in Macy and Winnebago. So it's one of those things where, um, you know, it, it's tough to kind of keep that community sense going and keeping that traditional feeling of, you know, food is medicine and spending time with your relatives is medicine and that kind of aspect. 
Um, but, you know, by, by having more virtual hangouts and kind of adapting how, uh, you know, we spend our time together, we can still try to address those traditional needs they need. Yeah, thank you. I think we're going to go move into uh, a, a short video. We have some video clips that we're going to show throughout the, the program today. And the first one is from Caitlin Meadows. It's, uh, she's going to share her story um, of anxiety. And uh, I want to thank her for uh, sharing her and opening up and, and sharing uh, to help others. And uh, so we're going to show that clip right now. I've had anxiety like my entire life. Then in high school, I got diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD, and depression. So like for me, testing anxiety was a real thing in high school. Like it was awful. I also, I love talking to others. I love public speaking. I love sharing presentations. But for me, it was always that I wasn't going to do it right. I was very much fixated on what I was going to do wrong and never what I was going to do right. Um, I was never perfect enough. I was so fixate, fixated on the negatives that I couldn't see the positives, which also led to the depression as well. I felt like everybody else around me was enjoying their life much more than I was enjoying mine. I was realizing some things from my past that um, I hadn't learned how to deal with. I was abused as a child um, in different ways uh, by a family friend and so it resulted in anxiety and PTSD. My mom never knew about that until um, I came out and told her about it. That was like a really hard thing for me, like I didn't want to admit to anybody that I was what I was going through, but um, my um, friends and um, my boyfriend at the time uh, really helped me like tell my mom the things that I needed to tell her. Once we found the real problem, I guess, the underlying issue, um, that was very relieving for me because I was able to get the help that I needed. Of course, I had my support system. I had my friends, my family, and um, especially like my siblings and my parents, they were, they were great help for me. Um, but for me, I, I did go through therapy and um, I would sit and talk to my mom uh, during my therapy sessions and my siblings. And I also did a lot of dancing during that time. Um, it was an outlet for me to express my emotion and I did theater and that really helped a lot as well. So I had all these things and then medication helped me get to that even better point. And um, it helped everything that was going on in my mind kind of quiet down. <laughs> I have definitely come to the point where I know how to say what I need and how I'm feeling. I really found like my people that I can talk to about these things that I don't feel like they're going to judge me because that's another part of anxiety. You feel like everybody's going to judge you. And so it's hard to talk about, to your, about your anxiety with people that you think are gonna judge you. My family has really been a crucial part in my life. I know that not everybody has that support. Not everybody gets that from their family, but I feel like everybody has somebody out there that can help them and that wants to help them. One of the things that Caitlin talked about there that, I mean, she talked about a lot of wonderful things that are very important that we could, uh, I think are important to focus on. But one of the things that she said is, you know, her family support and, you know, asking for help. And that's what we were talking about earlier is uh, that, you know, connecting and asking for that support, but also that, you know, she identified that something was wrong and, and asked, for, asked for that help. But Miguel, what, what, you know, if, I, if I'm a parent and um, I have a youth, what should I be looking for? What are some signs that my youth might be experiencing anxiety or uh, anxiety, PTSD symptoms? Yeah, the, the biggest thing I would say is, uh, are they in higher alert? 
or uh, did their energy just drop uh, uh, significantly? Um, I think those would be the bigger things. Um, if uh, maybe some nightmares too, or sleeping is just, uh, they're scared of sleeping. Uh, those are those are common symptoms of PTSD, but also symptoms of, of feeling anxiety um, or feeling like they don't have control over a certain situations. So that's some of the things to be looking into uh, for uh, traumatic responses uh, and just things that don't give them joy. If, if they used to love board games or video games and it just seems that they're just not enjoying that, uh, be aware and have those conversations of what's going on, how are you doing? Or you know, how, how can we spend quality time or can I play with you? Uh, and different interactive things that you can still do. Yeah, ab absolutely. Chris, you know, when we get a call, uh, when you get a call into into the hotline, um, you know, with, with anxiety, uh, some individuals have panic panic attacks. And we did have a question that came in from Claudia from from Bellevue that uh, it was interested in knowing, you know, if somebody is having a panic attack and they don't want to go to the emergency room, um, you know, do you get calls into the hotline that somebody is having a panic attack? What are some ways that folks can um, cope with that or manage that without having to go in and get connected with a professional uh, without using emergency resources? Well, one of the things when folks contact us and they're they're experiencing those kind of feelings, um, it's interesting to hear them talk about the um, physical feelings that they're having. Um, so a lot of times what we do is we really get them to take some deep breaths, um, try and calm down, um, one of the big things we always talk about with folks when they contact us is what kind of things can they do to distract themselves um, in those moments? What kind of things can they do to ground themselves and um, uh, not panic about something that, that's coming up in the future? Um, it, it can be a struggle. It, it's really tough when people have a full-on panic attack like that. Um, and sometimes we're very successful at being able to talk through it at the hotline, um, sometimes not. Sometimes they need more assistance than what we can provide. Um, but I appreciate, uh, she talked about in her video that how important it was to figure out what the root of her problem was, because once she figured out the root of the problem um, and she was able to connect her feelings with that, that cause, um, that's what helped her to be able to progress forward. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Nate, um, if if uh, somebody is suicidal, um, is that is that hereditary? We have a question from Facebook that somebody's wanting to know if if I if I'm suicidal, does that mean that my family member is going to be a suicidal? Um, I, I you know I don't know the the most recent research. Um, to, to my impression, you know it is not necessarily a hereditary thing, but um, general communal experiences and intergenerational trauma does exist though, where, you know, if there's a history of uh, mental illness or depression in your family, that could be something that attributes to that suicide rate. And especially, um, you know, it's with close knit communities, like most native communities, um, cluster suicides is often an issue as well. Um, that kind of anticipation of grief or that, um, just that cascade effect of grief after one, after another, after another, um, can be kind of extremely overwhelming for a lot of people. And can kind of just contribute to overall issues like that. Yeah. So if, if an individual is suicidal, does that mean they're going to be suicidal for life? That, that was another part of the question. I mean, is, are they going to struggle with that forever? Um, I mean, it's. I don't. I don't believe so. No. Um, suicide is one of those things. Typically, it's a. Uh, it's not a persistent, always one hundred percent of the time thing. Um, typically, it's um, as I say. Typically, not in all situations. It's you know. I don't say a passing thought, but just kind of an issue of right then and now. Um, that being said, mental, mental health and mental illness is something that does take um, focus. It takes work every day. You know, just like if you have heart disease, you can't one day all of a sudden decide to stop taking your heart disease medication because you feel like you don't need it anymore. Um, you know, it takes consistent effort where you have to keep up with that, keep checking on yourself and making sure you're taking the best care of yourself that you can. Yeah. Okay. Miguel, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your experience in working with suicidal youth? Yeah, I currently have um, uh, been working with a, a couple of my, uh, teenagers, uh, predominantly Latinx, and a lot of the of what they've struggled is the lack of hope, right? Uh, especially the in the global pandemic, and uh, maybe a lot of their parents are are losing 
uh, uh, jobs or are just like struggling financially and they really feel like they need to come and, and really save their family and feel this lack of hope. Uh, they see some of the societal levels, uh, uh, problems and issues that we have and, and they're just, again, the lack of hope. And so one of the biggest things is, is uh, practicing gratitude of what are we grateful today? Uh, what are things that we're grateful right now? Even in the midst of, uh, if they are going through crisis, even in the midst of, it feels like there's no hope. Uh, and try to remind them of the of the hope that exists uh, in in their community and in their, in their in their individual life, but also uh, in the, in the world. And so that's some of the biggest things that uh, that I try to bring. And of course, I like to joke around and you know have a good time, make them feel um, make them feel cared for, and and that uh, that it's okay to have these conversations. Uh, and that's not always very intense uh, conversations. And I think most teenagers get kind of kind of shocked. I'm like, oh, I can have this conversation. And so even they start kind of opening up more about what's really going on and what's going on at home. Yeah, and that's a, that's a key point that that it's 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 okay to talk about it. It's okay to talk about suicide, and that it doesn't make things worse. It actually makes things better. And that's that's a, a key point. Is that uh, communication is the key. Connectedness is the key. And uh, I, pre I appreciate your your comments on that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna now talk uh, and focus on a video. Uh, it's called the Brave Teen, and it's uh, Abby's going to share some information about some coping skills. Hey guys, it's Abby, and I wanted to talk about coping skills. So the first one that I use is probably one of my favorites. It's called the five senses breathing activity. Basically, when anxiety is high, you go through each of your five senses. So you would say, what's one thing that I can see? What's two things that I can hear? Three things that I can taste? Four things I can smell? And five things that I can touch? And it really helps to straighten out your thoughts in your mind and just get yourself collected. So definitely a favorite of mine that I recommend. The second one, I kind of made this up. <laughs> I call it the post-it note game. Mm, no, not game, more just the post-it note strategy. So I like to have a bunch of different bright colored post-it notes. I write down either something I'm thankful for or just something that's on my mind, something positive. So for example, I'm gonna write down, I am thankful for my mental so I'm going to go ahead and rip it off and I'm going to show you where I put it. I recommend putting it somewhere where you constantly look, such as a mirror, maybe a desk, anything like that. So we got lots of fun stickers just to make it, you know, just positive. So let's go ahead on the sticky notes. I'm thankful for my mental health. Positive quotes. It's a good way to just have some positive reinforcement in life. And it helps us to just find that light and hold on tight to it. I hope you all stay safe. So Abby talks about the five senses. I mean, those are some great coping skills, you know, taste, touch, smell, see and hear, and the, you know, the positive post-it notes. Um, coping skills are, are vital to um, helping us cope with many different things. And, um, you know, Chris, what are, what are some ways, you know, if there's, if there's teachers watching, parents watching, um, how do we help kids focus on coping skills? You know, how do, how, how do youth develop coping skills? Well, I love this video, quite honestly, because um, it she um, is empowered to do things to take care of her own mental health. A lot of times, you know, we're talking to kids about connections and who they can rely on, um, but sometimes it's, it's good for kids to consider what is it that they can do to start feeling better about things. So the grounding technique with the um, five senses is awesome. Um, when she uses the post-it notes with the affirmations, it's almost like uh, you train your brain to go opposite of the way that it normally does. So while you might be kicking yourself for something you said or did, or um, you're upset or sad uh, about something that's happened in the past, 
train your brain to flip it opposite and be more looking for more of the positives. What are things that I'm grateful for? Uh, what are things that, that I have done that I'm proud of? Um, what are goals that I have? So it's all about focusing forward rather than focusing on things that have maybe happened in the past. So I, to me, the, the empowerment of, of kids is a really, really important thing to do. They can't rely on adults to fix everything for them. Um, and it's a skill that they're learning um, as they move toward adulthood to be able to um, figure out those ways to be able to deal with their issues. Yes, absolutely. And um, Nate, you know, kind of going, going, uh, kind of connecting to that. You know, how, how do parents um, help kids engage in their mental health treatment? So, you know, in terms of your program, and the things in the work that you're doing, how, how do you help youth, uh, how do you help Native American youth engage in, in mental health treatment? I think the first most important thing is just having that open dialogue between the parents. Um, we have some youth in our program who, like, like us all, there's mental illness and mental health issues all around, but having that open conversation of, hey, you know, how's today going? Um, is today a good day? Is today a bad day? And just kind of acknowledging um, your feelings. A lot of the times, in any sort of culture, um, you know, there, there's that stereotypical, you know, men need to be macho and quiet, you know, don't share your feelings. Um, but I, I'm very op open with all the young men and ladies I work with. Um, and I say, you know, I, I want you to share your feelings. You know, if you're having a rough day, I want you to be open with that. And, you know, embrace that feeling and just acknowledge of what you're feeling instead of kind of pushing it out and hiding. Um, so I, I think just having that open family dialogue helps out a lot in the first place. Um, feeling like they don't have to hide if they're having a day where, you know, their anxiety up or their depression's up, where they can just say, hey, I kind of need to take today a little different. Um, I, I think that gets a lot more buy-in from youth, but as well as having that good connection with your counselor, um, just making sure that, you know, that relationship's healthy and that you've got a good rapport built with them and that, you know, you're also being open and honest with them because, you know, you're only going to get help if you both are working for that in an honest way. Absolutely. That communication and that connection. And that ties into a, a question that we have from a, a viewer in Superior. And, and Miguel, um, the, the, the viewer wants to know, uh, what could schools and administrators be doing to help virtual students feel connected or less alone you know, during this pandemic? Yeah, that, that is a, a really good question. And how do we engage in the off and off, on and off screen, which is something that we're kind of still struggling, I think even as adults right now, of like the Zoom fatigue and just being exhausted. And I think most of our uh, young and youth uh, are really are struggling within that. Um, I think engaging in more interactive things through in, in, the, in the session is really good, but also storytelling. Um, and it's like either through reading together or just sto uh, sharing stories about yourself. I think I've been uh, doing a little bit of more storytelling here in therapy of, of, of different stories or even through drawing, uh, allowing some music in the background and just let, letting them draw. And that is in itself a meditation and a self-soothing mechanism um, that I teach most of my creative and artistic uh, uh, teenagers uh, to be able to do either uh, if they're on Zoom, they can also, uh, they can always draw while you're, while you're still in Zoom class and you're still paying attention at the same time. Or if that's at home and, and you need that space or you need that break off the screen, that allows you to not go to TV or to your phone or anything like that, but allows you to just kind of connect yourself with your paper or with your art that you have. Um, so uh, adding more artistic things um, is what I would recommend. Yeah. So Miguel, how, how do you know, uh, how, how does a, a youth know that they have a good connection with their therapist? Yeah, so what we see is that uh, conflict can arise within the therapist. And, and that happens really common with young adults and uh, youth. And, and right away, one of the biggest things that as, as therapists, you know, it's build that rapport, build that trust uh, with that teenager. And again, uh, they might have uh, trauma. They might not trust us. They might be there because they don't, uh, because parents want them to be there. So building that trust is really important, but also knowing that I'm also, I may misspeak or I may, might misunderstand and uh, making sure that I apologize if I ever do that. At the same time, allowing them to to be themselves as we uh, we uh, sometimes in therapy we recreate some of the same things that we do uh, at home. 
And so how do we how do we readjust that and, and have healthy conflict if we do have conflict or, or if we do uh, if if there are projecting some of that anger or some of that sadness to me. Um, and and so I noticed I was like, hey, I noticed that you know when I mentioned this that uh, that bothered you. How um, let's talk about it more. Is, is there something I said or something that that could that I could be worded differently? And and it really recreates a whole other way of communicating, which is also very healing for for a young adult. Absolutely. So it's that, you know, role modeling that active communication and, and uh, uh, again, that connectedness, and that's, that's really important. Um, we're going to move into a very powerful story uh, from Kate Smith, who is a University of Nebraska student athlete, who's going to share her story now. I'm from Petrolix, Minnesota, and I'm a fifth year at the University of Nebraska. I play golf for the university. My freshman year and sophomore year were the hardest of college. I started on the team, I was traveling every week and I was having really good performances, but kind of that joy of the performance, once I came home, uh, just wasn't very happy. I struggled with, I think, identity a lot. I went and saw our psychologist, I got tested and had anxiety and depression and also um, borderline personality disorder. I was scoring off the charts for my athletic assessment and then on the other side I was hearing some hard news um, as far as my mental health. Division one student athletes are about three times more likely to experience anxiety and depression than those uh, regular students in their age group. A lot of these athletes are dealing with injuries. There's international athletes that we have a great deal being away from their families for months and months at a time and people going through a lot of different things especially for golf it's a huge mental sport so pretty much all of us are thinking about going to someone talking to them about our um, kind of mental side of the game as well as many other sports so you never really know if a fellow athlete is going to psychology to talk about their sport or to talk about personal things that they're dealing with. So I think that definitely gets a lot of the people in the door. But I still think there's a huge stigma of just like the conversations being had in the athletic department. I mean, it's very easy to talk about our competitions, our grades, our academics, but it's very often we pass each other and we say, oh, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, <laughs> and that's kind of where we leave it. I think for all athletes, it's kind of goes back and forth between um, something that can be comforting and something that can be stressful. For me, I think it was just finding the balance. It's hard, obviously, you have better moods when you perform well and worse moods when you don't perform as well. Um, but kind of how do we manage those highs and lows, knowing that if those practices don't go well, I have other activities that make me feel like myself again. When I play poor golf, like I go home and I start painting or I start drawing because it's easy for me to like channel that energy of disappointment into something that brings me a lot of joy. I try to reach out to others, definitely find that community and then don't be so hard on yourself. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> So that story really, uh, you know, I, I can personally, um, you know, I played sports in high school and college and, you know, just thinking about that, um, you know, she was really um, having trouble switching from a great game um, of golf and then being off the course. And, you know, so you're just so busy with school and homework and I mean there's always so much going on when you're a, when you're a student athlete but I think you know whether you're an athlete or if you're involved in other school activities and being involved in um, no matter what it is at school you know you can you can relate to this story and so Miguel I'm, I'm wondering um, can you tell us a little bit about you know maybe youth that you've worked with that and, and how you help individuals who are maybe struggling with, you know, they're just so, their plate is so full and they're having trouble shifting from 
um, maybe something they really enjoy, like golf or maybe speech or something that they're doing at school and then having trouble shifting to schoolwork or shifting to enjoying family or just enjoying life. Uh, yeah, so I had, uh, when I was working or doing my internship at the University at uh, Omaha, uh, we had a lot of driven college students. Uh, I had a couple that were musicians uh, and they needed to perform and they needed to do well. Uh, and uh, they were also trying to perform to get into like big, bigger shows and, and whatnot and, and just felt like I have a full plate, I have to do well. And that's where anxiety kind of either got rampant or depression got uh, rampant. And, and uh, a lot of the things was like, I know that we may not have time to be able to do a full on hour workout or like a full day of self care. Uh, so trying to find like small gaps within the day of five minutes or 10 minutes uh, that bring them joy. Is that like just sitting down and uh, watching some TikToks? Is that is this just sitting down, having lunch, and just enjoying uh, kind of your surroundings? Uh, so smaller pieces that can help you, especially if you're very driven and, and you're high stress, high less time to be able to do that. Um, and so we're trying to find some practical ways, and it takes some time because uh, me myself was very, very, very driven in, in undergrad and grad school. So I, I had three jobs. I'm working. I'm doing all this stuff, and I didn't know how to pause. And, and uh, learning how to pause and learning how to sit down and, and only for five or 10 minutes really, really makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nate, what have you seen in terms of your young adult groups and their need to get together? You know, what are they doing to stay connected when they can't be together? Um, so for the most part, I think we all know social media has a pretty large impact um, but, you know, that kind of is dual edged sword spending a time online. You know, we always used to preach, you know, get off your phone, go outside, do your thing. And uh, not, now we can't go outside and go do our thing. We have to kind of encourage that uh, digital connection. But I'd say, you know, digital resources have really helped out a lot, um, keeping that connection. Uh, a lot of our kids love to play games. Um, we used to love to share food with each other. Food is really big in Native culture. Um, every night we would host a uh, youth group, or not every night, every Monday night we would host a youth group at our uh, Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition in uh, downtown Omaha. And uh, I mean, we'd, we'd feed 30 to 40 kids easy a night. And it was one of those things where, um, you know, getting that together, that food is really awesome. Uh, but now that that's not possible because it's not safe, um, you know, we've sent some pizzas here and there, but we'll have some game nights where, you know, we'll all jump on Zoom and we'll play uh, some Scrabble or some bingo or whatever. Um, and it's just one of those things you have to provide other opportunities for people to have that support group and that engagement and, you know, get that peer support that they need to be successful. Absolutely. So there's there's other ways to get there's other ways to be connected. There's other ways to get connected. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to go to Sam Bates story. Uh, Sam talks about uh, weight, um, identity, bullying and how he managed uh, his mental health uh, throughout his young life and, in, uh, you know, throughout his uh, early career. So we're going to listen to Sam Bates story. I was a very happy kid up until about third or fourth grade and I started to uh, gain a lot of weight. Um, by middle school, I was over 200 pounds. The, the bigger I got, the, uh, the more upset about it I got, the more jokes I got made at my expense. So therefore, the more, you know, the further I fell into that depression. That was sort of where my mental health journey began. About two years ago was when I was finally able to um, sort of lose weight more the healthy way and successfully keep it off for the last couple of years. But it still is something that I have to remind myself every day that, you know, weight doesn't define me and that what I look like is not the most important part about me. When I started sort of discovering my sexuality, I didn't know that bisexuality existed. Um, so I, I spent about a year convinced that I was uh, like clinically insane, that there was something wrong with me because I knew that there was straight and I knew that there was gay, um, but I didn't know that you could be both. I sort of did research on my own and discovered what bisexuality was and just felt this sort of overwhelming sense of like knowing who I was all of a sudden. I was very good at uh, hiding my feelings and hiding sort of my depression and all the struggles with my identity. Um, so I actually started therapy because my mom took me because she thought I had ADD. 
And so I continued therapy on and off throughout middle school and high school. Um, I was on um, antidepressants for a few years and then have been sort of on and off of them since then. Being in therapy was a huge help for me. Um, being really involved in extracurriculars in high school was definitely um, a huge thing because I had friends in middle school, but I didn't really have like a core group of people that had a shared interest. And so when I started doing theater, um, it's just opened up this whole world and this whole family that I didn't know was out there. They sort of became my go-to people whenever I was going through something. So that's basically where I'm at now. It's just very much still sort of struggling with my sense of identity and with my body image, but I've definitely come a long way from sort of the formative years that really uh, sort of took a toll on me. My journey has definitely been sort of up and down, um, but over the past few years, I think just um, really focusing on myself and sort of learning to let go of the outside world sometimes. You can't control whether people like you, you can't control whether people are homophobic, you can't control whether so-and-so, like you, you have to focus on yourself, you can't take it personally. Just because you have bad days doesn't mean that those good days don't exist. And I'm definitely a living testament to that and very much appreciate that um, I didn't end things because I would have missed out on a lot of good experiences that I've had over the last 10 years or so. And um, I'm definitely grateful. So Sam said something very, uh, you know, very powerful is that you, know, you can't control uh, what other people think about you. Uh, you can only control yourself. And, you know, it's, it's important that, uh, you know, youth focus on themselves and take care of themselves. And Miguel, you know, when, when you're working with youth, ha have you worked with, with youth or worked with a young boy that has weight issues, bullying, identity issues? in the Latino community. Yeah, we we joke around that our aunts, our tias are, are our bullies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of shame culture in terms of weight um, that even myself have fallen from my own family of being like, oh, like, you know, I got the COVID weight and stuff. And, um, and, and so we kind of wrestle with that about your self-esteem and, and what it looks like and, and not to body shame yourself. Uh, and not allowing other people to body shame uh, how you look and, and, and going back to yet yeah, you're beautifully created uh, and whatnot. And I think that makes such a big difference in, in uh, youth self-esteem. Uh, predominantly in middle school, I, uh, I have a couple of teenagers in middle school that have really been struggling with that, uh, of not connecting with others because they feel that they're going to be bullied or made fun of because because of their weight or because even their height and things. And and so we, we've kind of worked on what, what do they believe about themselves uh, and that what what they believe about themselves is what matters. Um, and of course, like bullying is a, is a big problem that we have, um, uh, but it allows them to have that self-esteem. And I think that goes with identity all the way to, you know, you know, 23, 24. Like if you know who you are, and uh, you'll have that self-esteem and uh, it won't uh, affect you what other people uh, think about you or, or say about you uh, and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, we have a question from Facebook that um, asks, you know, how, how do we help a child that doesn't respond to any therapy or medication? You know, what are, what are um, options once your child has been in several maybe inpatient programs and the parents just don't see any progress. Um, if your child self-harms, thinks about suicide, has attempted suicide, um, but doesn't want to get better, you know, is that they're just not putting in the effort and they've really just tried many different things? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes it's the connection with the therapist that they've been going to see. Um, uh, it may be uh, a, a matter of what's going on in the home. Um, so it, it's really tough to answer that question um, without knowing more specifics. Uh, 
one of the things that we talk to kids about especially is um, that everybody is different. Um, we don't all fit into the same mold and that's okay. Um, and we're all gonna have good days. We're all gonna have bad days. I think um, in, in today's world with social media that it's really easy for kids to look at somebody else and think, wow, their life is so perfect. Um, mine is not, why can't I be like them? And it's all part of growing up, quite honestly, is learning to be able to work through um, those difficult times. Uh, because like he, he mentioned in the video, um, just because you have a bad day now doesn't mean that it's always gonna be that way. Um, there's, there's good things coming around the corner and every adult can tell you times in their life when um, things weren't going their way and they worked through it, they moved forward and um, have become stronger as a result. Absolutely, and I wanna, and I wanna build off of that a little bit too, is that, um, you know, that's that's really helpful and, and it's also important to, you know, to, to meet the youth where they are. Um, you know, if a youth is resistant to, to treatment, it just means that they're not, you know, they're not ready, they're not open to it. Um, and it's, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier in the program, with, with uh, Miguel in terms of, you know, how do you know if you have the right fit with that therapist? And um, you just really have to keep trying. And I think it's important that parents keep trying and, and, and do not give up. You know, you might have to, it might be a couple inpatient stays. You might be trying treatment. You might be trying a different, couple different levels of care. You might be trying several treatment providers, um, but keep, keep at it. And uh, that's what treat, you know, it's, it's finding the right physician sometimes or the right, uh, no matter what you're doing, you're, you're shopping around until you find that right connection. And that's no different with therapy. So, you know, there is a, a tremendous uh, amount of loss and grief right now. And, you know, how do we help kids that are feeling so lonely and lost? Miguel, do you, how do, how do we help, help youth right now? Yeah, a lot of our teenagers and young adults really feel lonely right now um, and really feel like, uh, when is this going to end, this, this connection? And so we, we've been talking a little bit about uh, the gratitude of, 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 this, uh, of this season, but also the gratitude of, of what, uh, what that looked like when, when, it wasn't, when we didn't have COVID or the pandemic, uh, of, um, of, of honoring and being grateful of those stories of what they had. Um, and knowing that they, they aren't alone, that's, that's something that I have to remind them um, and, um, and to connect with other friends or, or, or family members they just haven't connected in a while. And that's important. And I know there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of memes of being like, should I go check out all my friends? And, and, you know, and if you don't have that type of energy, then that's okay. I think a lot of our youth kind of feels guilty for not maybe checking on their friends or their friends not checking on, on them. And just uh, as a reminder that, like, we're all in it together and, and that it's okay that they feel that way uh, and, and just normalizing the sense of loneliness uh, at this moment. Yeah. And with the holidays being, uh, you know, so different this year and it's important that we continue to, to be physically distant, um, Nate, you know, what, what are some different things that we can do um, with youth? You know, when you're working with youth and thinking about the holidays, how are you helping them cope and, and uh, find different ways to celebrate the holidays with family? Um, because, you know, it's different. And in a way, it's grief. You know, they're, they're losing some of the traditions that they, they're used to. And so how are we helping them cope? Um, I think one, just kind of acknowledging that, you know, this is definitely an abnormal year, um, you know, where everyone is struggling with it. And it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely tough, but, you know, the end is very much in sight, um, you know, with vaccinations and everything rolling out, um, you know, hopefully next holiday season, things are back to normal. We can all go back to spending time with one another. But for the meantime, you know, the safest thing you can do is, you know, keep that distance going but um you know just because we're socially distant and you know not not physically close to each other doesn't mean you can't still be in contact with one another um so i'd say you know call people you use, use the technology we have you know give zooms might be a bit you know frustrating sometimes but um there's there's ways you can make those engaging you know there's ways you can play games you can screen share and watch a movie together 
um, you know, or even writing a letter. There's there's lots of ways where you can make up new traditions and kind of keep in contact with people that you know you maybe you've lost contact with, and um, you know maybe even trying to make new traditions as well. Um, you know, as I said, within the community, we typically have a big bingo that we get together for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and you know we give away Christmas prizes, and it's a great time. And this year, um, you know, it's it's all online, and that's okay. You know, it's it's one of those things that we know this year is completely different than it has been ever before. And uh, just being able to kind of roll to punches, so to say, and adjust how we're doing and just having that support and knowing that, you know, the safer we are now, the better it's going to be later for all of us. Absolutely. You, you make a very important point that, you know, this is a, a different different time. And it, it's, you know, it's important to, to continue to, to fiscally distance, but it's important to continually socially connect. And especially right now with uh, friends coming, maybe coming back from college and, and so forth, that we can still connect with them. And it's important that we do that. And we try to reach out to friends and family through other means, especially during this time of the holidays. That's really important that we do that to look out for ourselves for our symptoms, but also to stay connected with others. We're, all, we're gonna move into uh, another video. Um, the, it's a brave teen, Emma who's gonna talk about, you know, where we need to take one task at a time, a very, very important, uh, very important discussion. I've lost all motivation to do anything. I did start playing some music. I did open the blinds and turn the light on. I haven't really done anything else and it's already like 12 o'clock. I've been trying to get into routines. I can't do that either. It's all just, I feel like today has just been going downhill. My anxiety is really high, even though I'm in my room alone. And insecurities and all of that. It's really hard for me to focus. And it's been getting harder. Maybe I'll clean my room and I'll start there. You know, whenever stuff happens like this, you just take it one task at a time start with making your bed or start with taking a drink of water that's one task completed we'll see how today goes we'll do tasks one at a time starting with my room and making my bed here we go so here i am at the end of the day watching scooby-doo sketching after taking a shower I was really productive today. I got up, I cleaned, and I went and made s'mores, and I wrote a lot of new stuff, and I painted a lot. Overall, taking everything task by task minimized my stress a lot for today, and I get to end it doing what makes me relax the most, sketching and watching Scooby-Doo. Today started out really rough, and it was the same way for the past three days, but I mean, some days you just gotta take everything one minute at a time. It's almost been 12 hours since I made that other video, and in the 12 hours I feel, I feel better. Yep, that's all I gotta say. So I'm gonna sketch some more and go to sleep. So Emma talks about taking one step at a time when you just don't have any energy and you're just not feeling lethargic, uh, not motivated. Um, you know, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, youth, parents, teachers are watching, what are the signs and symptoms of depression?
or Miguel, can you tell us a little about the signs and symptoms of depression? Yeah, one of the symptoms of depression is definitely the the sleep of uh, sleeping all day, every day, uh, or just feeling extremely more exhausted than what you normally are. Um, the lack of motivation, uh, again, the things that used to give you joy don't give you any joy anymore. Uh, you're isolating yourself from friends and from family. Uh, so we, we saw a prime example of what kind of depression looks like on the previous video. Um, and, and just getting up is just so hard with depression. And so some of the, uh, those are some of the symptoms of, of, of depression. Okay. And could you, uh, um, Tell us in terms of if somebody's feeling uh, suicidal, if, if you have a friend who tells you that they're having thoughts of suicide, what, what should you do? If you have a friend who's suicidal, um, what, should, what should you do? Yeah, uh, first, uh, you know, acknowledging and thanking them that they, they approached you uh, and have that trust with you. Second, you know, contact an adult if you aren't an adult of, of what's the next steps. And then, of course, there's the, the suicide uh, hotline to be able to have that conversation. And some of the things that we've talked with some of our teenagers is like, hey, you can make that call with uh, with your friend uh, or you can get an adult and all three make that call together. And that's kind of a, a good proactive way um, to have those kind of conversations because it can feel very, very overwhelming if, 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 uh, if you've never done that kind of conversation. Absolutely. And could you uh, tell the audience and, and say this in Spanish that, you know, you are not alone and take it one thing at a time. Yeah. So, no está solo, haz todo uh, día por día, porque eso se va a mejorar. Absolutely. Chris, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if many people, I think a lot of people know, but, you know, there's the Boys Town National um, Hotline, and then there is the, um, the National Suicide Helpline, and when you call into that helpline, it goes right in, right into, into Boys Town. It, um, Nate, can you tell us about um, when you're working with with youth? Um, is that a is that a resource that's often used in in your program? Definitely, um, I think any of the hotlines you know that we, you guys have mentioned today in the list of resources, um, we definitely recommend to get these out to our youth as much as possible. Um, most importantly, I think it's just important for people to know that. Um, it's okay to reach out and it's okay to have moments of weakness and issues. Um, you know, that's what makes us all human. You know, if we were, if we were perfect 24 seven, you know, none of us would ever need medicine or anything like that. But, um, to realize that, you know, you're going through some issues or you need help. Um, that's a very human thing and that's very normal. And, uh, especially in the native community, you know, it, it takes a village quite literally to raise people and be successful. So there's nothing wrong with reaching out to, you know, a loved one or even, you know, someone you're not as close with, but someone you can just kind of open up with. Because sometimes that the people you're closest with is sometimes tough to open up with because you don't want to be vulnerable to them. Um, but just just knowing that there's lots of people out there to support you and kind of having that support system and knowing who your support system is. So that way, if things kind of start to get rough or start to have a, a tough time, um, you can kind of work through those. But I would definitely encourage all the um, resources we've been linking today throughout the whole well-beings, you are not alone um, presentation. Um, they're all great resources. These people will all listen to you and give you the assistance you need. Yeah, absolutely. And and Miguel, um, you know, in terms of, of resources and, and asking for help, um, you know, we talked about earlier that it's okay to talk about suicide that it doesn't does not make things worse. Um, can you just br briefly just touch on that again? That you know that um, and and maybe mention that and you know talk about that, but also mention that in Spanish that it's it's okay to ask for help. You know, talk about suicide if you're struggling. Ask for help and to call that one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five number. Yeah, one of the biggest misconceptions that uh, the. I think society is that uh, if we talk about it, more people are, are going to want to uh, die by suicide, but actually not. Like by having these conversations, it's where we can actually heal in community and have those resources and be able to provide uh, um, that type of community and care and love that that individual might need um, and whatnot. And so 
Um, so yeah, so parte es uh, seguir platicando sobre tu salud mental porque es muy importante en, en decidir uh, que, y hablar sobre qué, me, qué es lo que me cuesta. So I, en uno de los números más importantes que tienes que saber es el 1 888 66 8660 y es alguien un lugar donde puedes llamar y, y sabes que tal vez con tus padres no vas a poder tener esa conversación que te gustaría pero sabes que siempre hay profesionales que puedes platicar Miguel uh, Chris and Nate I want to thank you um, for for being here today um, it's been uh, you've been very helpful in providing great information and resources uh, for our program um, I, I want to you know, end by saying that, you know, it's very important that, you know, connectedness is the key. Um, there's a lot of research out there that says the more connected our youth are to friends, family, the community, um, the less likely it is that they're going to, you know, act out towards themselves, others, and the better mental health that they, that they are going to have. And, you know, having that support is so important and also asking for help is okay. It's a sign of strength. Uh, there is hope, there is help, there is healing. And uh, through hopefully through today's program, we've been able to shed some light on some of those things, provide resources for, uh, for the state of Nebraska to help you get, you, uh, get folks connected. And that it's, it's normal to feel lonely right now. Um, we're going through a tough year, but you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, the vaccine is out. There's a lot of things happening and uh, reach out for help. You know, look out for yourself, look out for your own symptoms, ask for help if you need to, but also connect with your friends and family and look out for their symptoms as well and help get them connected resources if you need to. Um, look for one thing that gives you joy this holiday season and, um, and take care and thanks for joining us today. Thank you.